Uh, good morning, everybody. Um, hope you're all well today. I hope you've managed to cool down a little bit overnight. Uh, <laughs> it was certainly much cooler this morning. Um, so for today, the, uh, I will be talking about decisions, but I want to start with a few small practical things. Um, the format is going to be a bit different from yesterday. Yesterday, I've done a lot of theory, and we'll be putting a lot of the things that you've learned yesterday into practice. Eric has done an absolutely fantastic job uh, at explaining some theoretical things, and today uh, we'll be more doing. Uh, we'll be do also doing theory, but there will be also be a large part of exercises. So, if you are sitting in the middle, like there, <laughs> I see a few people. If you could move to the side, that would be very helpful because there will be quite a bit of exercises. I'm hoping to spend about one hour in total on exercises where I will just walk around. And if you want me to uh, guide you a little bit, uh, yes, Alexander. Uh, I have. Ah, uh, yes, we could do. Yes, we could do that too, yes. If there's enough space to leave one row open, that would be... Yes, okay, okay, thank you, Alexander. So Alexander is suggesting after the break, when we reconvene, uh, to leave one row open between every uh, occupied row so I can walk uh, a little bit uh, between the rows to give some guidance where need be. Okay, so um, I, I don't think I have... There are exercises in the first hour, but they are more me showing how it works, and it's kind of less important that I walk around. But for the second half, this will definitely uh, be more prominent. So if you go to the website of the SIPTA school, so if you have your laptop uh, with you, uh, I suggest to just do this now so you don't need to figure this out later when I start doing things. So here are the, the Pitbon uh, <laughs> notebooks. Um, it was a very popular language, and it still is, uh, I think, uh, yeah. Um, so if you click that link, uh, this will bring you to Google, Google Colab, and there are like three links you can click, and these are three uh, exercises, sets of exercises that we'll go through. The first one is me really showing how it works. The second and the third one I will show a little bit, but they're more for you to work through. So I will make you or work in this uh, session, uh, it will be uh, much more hands-on than uh, yesterday. Um, so um, so if, you, if, you, if you can find that link, that would be great. All right, so let's get started. So uh, my name is Matthias, uh, I'm from Durham. Uh, if you have any questions during the lecture, please just raise your hand, stop me at any time. I'm very happy to, to, to be a bit interactive, and I, I rather go a bit slower to make sure that you understand things. So I'll be talking about decisions, and uh, I don't know how your day started. My, my day started rather uh, interesting. I was standing in the elevator, and I was standing with someone else, and they said, uh, the provision for today is rain. They literally said that the provision uh, for today is rain. So I knew two things. First of all, this person is probably Italian. Uh, <laughs> and, um, um, yeah, and the other thing I knew is nothing could go wrong because the first conversation I had included the word provision. That made me uh, really, really happy. Uh, and it was uh, interesting as well because uh, why they were saying this, because they were checking in their bag whether they had their raincoat with them. Then I came down to the lobby and I saw the actual forecast and they showed me, look, there's the forecast for rain. And I saw an 8% probability of rain. Now, we know the interpretation of that is, uh, as we discussed yesterday, <laughs> is uh, difficult. It's, it's not clear uh, what that might mean exactly. Uh, but uh, to me, this means, yeah, it's, it's probably not going to rain. And if it rains, it's not going to be much. That was my interpretation of this. But yet, they really emphasized this. And this, this brought home to me a very important uh, principle that um, uh, even if probability of certain events are uh, low, this does affect the decision making. The message why this person was saying this, it was to kind of share the concern and the decision to bring a raincoat. So I went up back to my room and I took my uh, raincoat and then I went back down. So they, they changed the course of my day a little bit. Um, and that's, that's something uh, very important. So prediction and decision, they're not quite uh, the same thing. And I want to start with a, a, a little quote, or my son tells me, this is a meme, 
uh, I don't know uh, what a meme is. I ask him what is a meme, and he says, I don't know, but I know one when I see one. Uh, so I think he thought this was a, a little bit funny. I, I don't know why it is meant to be funny. Maybe it is uh, in ways that I really don't understand. The burdens of modern parenthood are uh, very, very heavy. Um, but uh, I really like this quote. So this is from Katie Leung. Who is Katie Leung? Does someone know this? A neuroscientist. It is the first girlfriend of, sadly not me, of Harry Potter. So uh, this is an actress. Um, uh, and I really like this. I mean, this is someone who presumably knows nothing about probability, let alone imprecise probability or statistic. I assume I actually don't know if they do, but they're, they're, they're probably not trained in this. Uh, yet they make this statement. And I think uh, you can ask yourself, why are we here? What are we really trying to address? What is the purpose of, of us being here? And I think this, this, this quote really cuts to the heart of this. And this is something that... Um, is very prevalent in, in reality, not just on personal decision making, but also decision making in business and in industry and so on. Um, the fear of making the wrong decision, yeah, that leads to indecisiveness. So, and I think, I really genuinely believe that uh, bounded probability or interval expectation and models like that, they can bring a ray of hope in the face of all that uncertainty. And my, my ambition in life is to have this as a meme next to KT Leung one day. Uh, although I doubt that will happen, but that would be, that would be great, wouldn't it? So uh, the fear of making the wrong decision. So how, how, how can you handle that fear? How do people deal with this in, in practice? And why does imprecise probability maybe help with that? It's because uh, with imprecise probability, we can explicitly model this indecision. We can explicitly take it into account in ways that, uh, that are uh, convincing, that are very convincing, I think. And uh, so, yeah, with this quote, I think it's very important. If you, take, if you can take one message away from this entire school, and that's the message, I'll be really, really happy that with these methods, we can kind of somehow contain that fear and turn it into something positive by doing mathematical modeling and by convincing people how can we deal with this in a better way. So, uh, and it's all about decision making, of course. Um, so I will start with a, a little introduction um, as I've just kicked off with that. And I will use an example from industry, offshore wind. It's, it's an area I've, I've worked with a lot in the last uh, eight years. Um, so this is just very, very light touch. And then I'll go on with a brief review of classical decision theory, and I will show you a result which has been somehow forgotten. Uh, it's a result from Wald, um, which shows how indecision comes about in statistical reasoning. And this result is from Wald from, from way before people, well, it's not from way before people were doing imprecise probability, but it's way before it became, it became a big, big field, let's say. Um, uh, th this, this already shows you how indecision uh, arises in statistics, and that gives a nice justification for using sets of probability measures uh, that you don't see uh, 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 anywhere, I think. Uh, so I will, I will give it here. So let's start with a bit, uh, bit of uh, a look at uh, the recent news. So this is an article from the 1st of August. Yeah, so um, this is quite recent. So offshore wind farms connected by underwater power grids for transmission could revolutionize how the East Coast in the U.S. gets electricity. So I don't know if you know this, probably not, but uh, the U.S. is really behind on offshore wind uh, energy compared to uh, most of uh, Europe, at least uh, the countries that have coastlines. Um, so, uh, and they're trying to get ahead of this game. And one of the things that is happening is that these offshore wind farms, they become more profitable. It becomes, uh, becomes actually quite valuable to put them really far out in the sea um, because then the wind, wind blows, blows just harder. Um, but the problem is if you put lots of long lines from the wind farm to the coast and you have a lot of wind farms, this becomes very inefficient. So people are thinking about how do you connect these together and then have fewer very long lines which are very expensive and if they break it's extremely expensive to uh, to repair them so how do you how do you do this more efficiently yeah and these are big really big decisions you need to make planning decisions about where are wind farms likely going to be built 
uh, and things like that. And this goes on for decades. This is planning decades ahead. Uh, and who's going to do that? How are we going to fund this? Who's going to pay for this? Uh, who's going to profit from this? And so on. So there's a huge, huge, huge scope for uh, very big, severe uncertainty. And of course, with all this uncertainty, it becomes indecision. If there's indecision, nothing happens. So and that's, of course, not good. So something has to happen. And it's very interesting to see this in the news. I think this uh, is a, certainly an area where imprecise probability can help us. Um, Here's another one, uh, Japan to collaborate with the US on cutting floating offshore wind. So this is completely related to the previous part where uh, um, if you want to put wind for, uh, wind, offshore wind farms very far out, you have to make them floating. Uh, this is a very new thing. This is a fairly new technology. I think there's the first ones have just been built. Uh, so it's, it's very unclear how that cost is, how that's going to cost in the long term. I mean, you have very little data about this because it's a completely new technology. And again, with such severe uncertainty, uh, you need some way to, to manage that. I think this is a very nice uh, story. So they're planning to uh, 15 gigawatts of floating offshore wind. Now you can't, maybe you don't have an idea of what the scale of this, this is. Uh, I think there's about 30 gigawatts installed worldwide right now. So um, this is... Uh, Extremely ambitious and extremely uh, huge. I think it's a big. I, I honestly don't think they will pull this off by that time. But seeing that ambition there is certainly a very good thing. Uh, you also have other aspects of it, and this is from the uh, the New York Post. Uh, it's more, yeah, not the kind of newspaper uh, I would normally read, but I uh, <laughs> I thought I'd bring this as well. Nantucket wind farm wreck reveals the true cost of the left's green energy push. So lots of. Uh, 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 negative uh, things. So uh, here, first of all, you know the, these numbers don't correspond with the other article. This is kind of interesting, isn't it? So um, I don't know where they got that 30 gigawatts from, but um, you have a very negative story where there has been a failure of the technology, and this affects the public perception. And of course, this is also part of the risk management that you have to do. Uh, this is something that should be taken into account. So although this uh, this is not a very nice uh, uh, article, it does convey a something about risk analysis that you maybe want to take into account, and it's maybe dif difficult to account for, but maybe should, especially if you're planning to uh, do huge like infrastructure work. Okay, so with that, uh, just a few small examples of how this uh, is relevant to decision-making, uh, imperceptibly might be relevant to decision-making in practice. So um, let me just, just dig, dig in a little bit more into this problem, and then we'll, 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 we'll look actually at an example, a work a statistical example in a bit, but let's just think a bit about this problem. So, uh, the, not the main cost, but 30%, a very large fraction of the cost is just operations and maintenance. Yeah, and uh, this is much larger for offshore wind than for onshore wind. And the reason for that is that it's just hard to get to. Yeah, so maybe you need to fly in some people with a helicopter. Uh, you have to shut down the farm. You, have, you can't land people on that when it's extremely windy. You need to look at the weather. Maybe you can get there by boat, but then if the waves are very high, you can't really board uh, the turbine. And especially for floating turbines, yeah, you can imagine for a fixed one, this might be easier, but for a floating one, this becomes uh, even more difficult. Okay, so there's different types of maintenance that you can do. You can do preventive to prevent failures. There's corrective fixing after failure. And of course, preventive is cheaper than uh, corrective. Um, so, um, what do you want to do? So, the, the thing that business, that drives businesses minimize cost. Yeah, that's normally uh, uh, what you try to do. In some some generalized sense, it doesn't mean just monetary, but in some generalized sense, think uh, utility, uh, if you know what that means. Um, so when do we perform maintenance? What is a good preventive corrective balance and so on? And you have uh, a lot of uncertainties and you can, you can save costs by making accurate predictions. Yeah? Uh, and we were talking about um, uh, subjective probability and all that. What means accurate predictions? Of course, it means predictions that correspond with, with what happens in reality. Predictions that are convincing, for which I have a convincing argument uh, that they are true. So uh, you have wind and waves at different time scales. Could be a next hour you want to know it, you want to maybe also know it for the next year, what kind of pattern is going to be, uh, what are the wave patterns going to be so you can plan ahead. You want to avoid missing maintenance opportunities, you want to also avoid uh, transport, like sending a boat off to 
some wind farm uh, 100 kilometers off the, sh off the shore. This, this, the, the distances are like that these days. Uh, and then find out you can't board a turbine. Yeah, so that's that's very costly. Uh, you also want to forecast fares before they happen. Yeah, so these are all kinds of uncertainties that uh, are important. And um, and there are different timescales, as I said. You have a short time, what data on wind farm should we collect? How should you use it? You have a business case, how do you convince investors to uh, invest in offshore wind? Uh, what kind of tools do you have to support businesses to make those investments? Uh, and then you have the long term, that's policy and politics. And I'll think about that last article, for example, uh, where uh, green energy is put in a very negative light because of uh, some pollution that has happened. Yeah, so should you encourage offshore? Should you look at other technologies? Uh, you have really big uncertainties, especially nowadays with climate change and all these things. Uh, you have the strange attitude of the political climate is a bit weird right now, right? Uh, so you have strange things happening in politics, and it's 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 not just money, of course, that uh, plays a role. Okay, so um, so why would you then use bounded probability? So this 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 brings us back to the very first. Uh, uh, quote I had, so when you have this severe uncertainty and there is this fear of making the wrong decision, and what you want to do is have models that can give you good confidence in the decisions that you make and just good confidence in the predictions that you make. Um, and I think bounded probability can really help with this, and at all levels and time horizons, but especially at the long-term horizon, I think it becomes very clearly relevant, but also at the shorter time scales, it can be very useful. Uh, also, industries are typically risk averse, so they really care about rare events with large impacts. Yeah, this is something that's very important uh, to 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 many industries, that includes the power generation industry, like nuclear industry for sure, uh, but also also in other. Uh, industries this is the case. So there are of course also reasons not to use it. I mean it's computationally expensive to do. Yeah, that's, uh, we have to be honest about that. There's this definitely computational limitations, although they become less in the, in the last decades with increased computing power. Um, there is, um, if you are in a case where you have un abundant data and the decisions are not so critical, maybe it's just not necessary, and a standard statistical church might work as well. Okay, so bounded probability really serves a, a, a specific purpose, and it's not always appropriate, and I think we, could, we should also say that. So the other question is how do you communicate uncertainty? Now, we, we don't talk too much about this in the school, but this is also really important, uh, and I don't feel like I'm an expert on that, but there are definitely people who think about this a lot. Um, communicating probability is already very, very difficult, so communicating bounded probability uh, might be even harder. Uh, and uh, yeah, so this, so this is a question um, I think it should be asked. Uh, I don't have a good answer to that myself, but there are certain people. Uh, who have. Okay, so let's um, start with, uh, I'm already oh, ooh, I'm already seven minutes behind, but that's okay. So let's uh, start with a brief review of classical decision theory, and I will use this example of offshore wind uh, to kind of demonstrate a few things, and particularly demonstrate Wald's theorem, which I think provides a very nice and very uh, rarely mentioned uh, motivation for, uh, for boundless probability. So um, I'm going to assume some statistical, I'm using some statistical language here, but um, so I'm going to assume I have a parameter. A parameter is a name for something you don't know. Yeah? And my parameter is going to be very simple. It's going to be the wave height, average wave height in the next hour. Yeah? So stand, you're standing at this, you consider this offshore wind farm. There is a wave height in the next hour. I don't know what's that going to be. I call this uh, uh, X. Yeah? And that's my parameter. Um, I have my data. I have observed the wave height in the last hour. I have, I have some measurements about that, so I have knowledge of this. Okay, and for simplicity, of course, I might have a whole time sequence, but I'm just going to average that out for the last hour. Uh, and again, I'm going to assume that for both of these, there's just two possible values. Of course, that's completely unrealistic. It's just a way of simplifying the problem and focusing the thoughts. So for both X and Y, for the wind height that's going to come, the parameter and the wind, the, so the wind height, the wave height, uh, that's the come and the wave height that has been, I assume it's between a half and two, yeah? Okay, so, uh, and then I have to make a decision, yeah? So I have to make a decision, do I go to my offshore wind farm to do some maintenance or do I not, yeah? And then we have this thing, a decision strategy, which is basically saying, what should I do uh, if I observe y is a half? 
I, should I take the boat then or not? What should I do if I observe y is 2? Should I take the boat or not? So it's a function that takes the data and maps it to a decision. Yeah? So that's a decision strategy. Yeah? It's a decision as a function of the data. All right. So that's kind of the setup. Uh, I need a little bit more to solve the problem. It just uh, defines basically the terminology and the kind of the problem space. Um, so we need a few more things. So the thing you need to make a decision is a utility function. So utility function is a function of decision and the parameter. So it tells you um, uh, for each combination of decision and unknown parameter, what the cost, uh, or rather, what the, 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 the utility, so the negative cost is the opposite of uh, cost, is going to be. So uh, we can only board the turbine if um, x is less than 1. So um, um, uh, if, if x basically is a half, yeah, then we can board a turbine, otherwise we don't. So if we take the boat and the wave height is a half, then I can do some maintenance and I get something positive out of this. Yeah, so um, this saves us four thousand, but we have to pay one thousand for the boat, so we gain three thousand in total. Yeah, I express this in monetary values. Of course, I should use utility to do this properly, but just to focus the thoughts, I'm just going to do it like this. Um, if we can't board, then I've just paid for this boat one thousand, and you know. Uh, that's lost, yeah? So I lose this 1,000. I cannot do any maintenance. I'm not saving anything. If I don't take the boat, then uh, nothing happens. There's no consequence, immediate consequence for that. So I'm assuming this is zero, okay? So with these utilities, with these assumptions in this model, I have now a little bit more information to solve this, but I need some probabilities to really do it properly. So I'm going to assume a classical, this is classical decision theory, so I need to set up the probability on uh, the joint probability measure for x and y together. And the way this works in statistics normally is by specifying a likelihood and a prior. Yeah, this is just the way people do things. Yeah, this is a standard way of doing things. So the likelihood is the probability of seeing the data given the parameter. Now, this problem is a little bit weird. So there's a probability of having a certain wave height in the last hour, given that the wave height in the next hour is going to be uh, something. Yes, yeah, so it's a little bit strange. The likelihood is a bit weird, and that's because uh, I've uh, simplified this problem in, a, in, a, in this way. Uh, but you could assume you have some historical data of, you know, joint data that allows you uh, to, to calculate this. Uh, and similarly, a bit less strange for this problem here is the prior probability. So this is just my prior probability right now. What I, do I think the wave height is going to be right now based on whatever other information I have uh, besides uh, the data? Uh, and here it's uh, 0.4 for a half, 0.6 for uh, two. Yeah, so that's without looking at the data, uh, without seeing the past observation. What would I think it might be uh, based, maybe for example, on uh, weather forecast or something else? Okay, so that gives me these two things together will give me a full joint probability, fully described probability of this problem. Now uh, you may, we haven't talked about this uh, at all, but the classical, like really classical way of doing decision making uh, is ju ju just use the likelihood. Yeah? Uh, there's another way to do decision making, which is called Bayesian statistics, which uses both the likelihood and the prior. Yeah? And I'm going to explore the relationship between these a little bit, and we will see that uh, imprecise probability comes out of that. So that's pretty cool. So. Um, so let's let's start with frequentist, just frequentist probability. Just and that I just mean just using the likelihood. I don't mean it is that I interpret probability in a frequentist manner at all. I don't mean that at all. These can be subjective probabilities for all I know. They can be uh, um, however you want. Uh, I just mean I'm going to use the likelihood. Yep, just the likelihood. So uh, in Wald's description, what he does is we're going to calculate an expected utility. So we only have the likelihood. We only have this distribution. Yeah, and the kind of logical quantity. So I need to know x to know the distribution of y. So the only thing I can really meaningfully calculate if I have some decision strategy, I need to know x. And if I have x, then I can calculate this conditional expectation, which is just this expression. Yeah. 
uh, and that's my expected utility. But now I have a value for each value of x. So how do I compare different strategy? Because I have, for each strategy, I now have a function of x. Well, uh, the way to go about this, according to Wald, according to frequent statistics, and many, I should say, so this is a, a, an abstract model, but many uh, frequentist methods can be formulated in this way. So, you know, confidence intervals and things like that, which are typically based on the likelihood, um, they, can, they can be phrased uh, in this manner with some imagination, but uh, it can be done. Um, so we say that the strategy is inadmissible if there is another strategy that has a higher walled expected utility for every x. Yeah? So uh, I have a, this is exactly walled's definition. Um, uh, so I, I want it to be dominate. So it needs to be large or equal to delta and strictly larger for at least one x. Uh, then clearly, if that's the case, I should not take delta, yeah? There is a, because there is a strategy that will give me a better outcome regardless of the true value of the unknown parameter, yeah? So um, this gives me a partial ordering of strategies, yeah? And the idea is then to take all admissible strategies. So any strategy that's not dominated by another one, I will call admissible and we'll take them. So I simply take maximal elements with respect to partial ordering. Yeah, uh, I will explain more about this if you don't quite fully get what this is. We'll demonstrate this in some computer in, in, with the computer in a bit, and this will come back a lot later. So, don't worry too much if you don't fully uh, get this right now. Okay, but the idea is that there can be multiple options that are optimal. There's no unique best decision here according to this uh, criterion, um, and so there is some element of indecision here. Yeah, explicit. And I've not done imprecise probably, I've just done frequent statistics. Yeah, so it's fascinating, isn't it? Um, so let's go, uh, are there any questions at this point? Yes, it's exactly that, yeah, it's exactly that. Any other questions? Yes. <laughs> Well, not equally good, incomparable strategies, yes. Yeah, so that's, that's the thing, they're incomparable, and that incomparability is how we, how we interpret indecision. Yes, yeah. You then need to make some judgment of how you're gonna pick that, yeah, yeah. Yeah, so what this gives you is a, a justification for not picking, if this condition is satisfied, you should not pick delta. You cannot justify that. There's a justification for not doing that. But what, what, the other one you pick, you don't have to use whatever. Uh, we'll come back to this. Yeah, we'll come back to this. There are, there are ways you can handle this. And I will show you one way to do that right now, actually. But this is a very good question, yeah. Any other questions? No? All right. Okay, very good. So let's... Um, Let's, let's try to bring in the prior so, uh, distribution. So the prior distribution allows you to do one thing, and let's apply Bayes' theorem, and it looks like this. So from the likelihood and the prior, I can do some calculation here, and I can get another distribution, and this happens to be the distribution of the parameter given the data. This is kind of a natural thing. You don't know the parameter, you do know the observation, so it's kind of natural to look at that. And then for every decision, so now I no, no longer need to care about decision strategies, uh, for every decision I can calculate a posterior expected utility. This is, I think, the natural thing to do uh, here, yeah? And then I can just simply define an optimal base strategy as one that maximizes the posterior expected utility for each data point, for, for each y. I can calculate this expected utility for each, uh, for each decision and why, and then I just maximize, I find the one that maximizes the expected utility. Okay, so this is a tr like traditional classical way you usually will see uh, decision making uh, under uncertainty presented within a Bayesian framework. Okay, so this is much easier to calculate, right? You don't have to do this partial ordering. Yeah, this is simpler. It's much simpler. So, uh, so I mean, even that, just that is already maybe an argument for using Bayesian uh, analysis. Um, so at least if you 
as opposed to Walt's framework. Yeah, uh, there are frequent methods that don't have this, uh, don't need to do, worry about this partial ordering. Uh, but here within this framework, certainly uh, the Bayes uh, method seems um, uh, much easier because you don't have to check this dominance across all the strategies. You just need to find the maximum of this function. Okay. So uh, any questions about that? Okay, so we'll do this calculation uh, in the notebook in a moment. Um, so here's Walt's theorem. Um, and he basically says that these two things I've shown you are the same in a very specific sense. So the um, set of Walt admissible strategies can be completely recovered from a Bayesian analysis by varying the prior over all distributions. And this is not an exact, a mathematically exact statement, um, but it's kind of, it gives you the um, like main message. So there's an equivalence of robust Bayesian statistics, where you have a set of priors and a precise likelihood, and frequentist statistics. These are the same, effectively the same thing. Yeah? The, the correct statement that you're going to prove, maybe, it is quite tricky, is that normal form, robust base maximality, and walled admissibility are the same thing. But you have to do a small modification to Wald's uh, admissibility definition to make it work. And there are some technical things, and I'm saying normal form, and I'm not going to explain what that means uh, uh, because it's going a bit too far. But that's the exact statement, um, uh, and that's part of the exercises. Okay, so um, I'm going to just uh, now, just quickly going to go to this call lab. So if you have your computer, please uh, uh, open these. So it's a first notebook. Uh, that we have. Um, so let me open this myself. So this is the very first one, classical decision theory, I pi bn. So if you do that, you get this. So um, this is Colab. I, I'm assuming you don't know this uh, platform. I didn't know this until quite recently. In fact, this is my PhD student who taught me how to <laughs> use this in the last few weeks. Uh, it's very nice, very cool. So what it allows you to do, it allows to, to, you can read stuff and you can run code yeah, as part of this. So I would suggest, uh, has everybody managed to open this? No? Okay, I'll give you some time. So if you're not sure, you go to the program and then you have this link here to go collab you click this that's not did you click the link from the website yeah 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 did you click from the website Oh, maybe try again. Maybe try again. So if you click this, I'm just going to give some time because... Yeah? Okay, so if you click this, you should see my GitHub username. You should see this repository. There are other repositories, but you don't want to look at that. Main branch. And then you click that first link. And then you get here. Has uh, everybody managed? Is there anybody still? Yeah, all good there. Can I see the people have it? Yeah, all good. Okay, awesome. So um, I would suggest that you click this thing, copy to drive. That will copy the notebook to your local, and that means that the changes you make are saved. Yeah, for this first one, it's not so important, but maybe just um to to just to, as a as a, just to get used to this i would say click this i'm not going to click this but you can click this and then it will work on your own copy and it will save all your work yeah i don't care about my work being saved here so i won't click it um so that's the first important thing um is this large enough i wonder if i should just increase the size a little bit there we go yeah that's better um so you click this thing um, I would also suggest that you look at runtime, this is an important one, and then do run all. Okay, so this will run all the code. It's been run already, but just do it. Yeah, just do it. Uh, so I'm getting a war warning, but this should be fine. Okay, and you'll see there's some things happening here, and it will just basically do all the calculations. All right. 
Can I see some nods if people have managed to run it? Yes. Is someone still struggling? Yerik is still struggling. I will. Run time. Run all. Or you do control F9. That works too. Yeah. Okay, you run all. Okay. So there are some things written here. Um, so the first thing we need to do when we do coding, we need to decide on the representation. I've opted for a very simple representation of probability mass functions and gambles that we've uh, covered in, in a lot of detail yesterday. So a probability mass function, say we have a possibility space of size 3. So I'm just going to pick an ordering. So A, B, C, it's kind of logical to take A, B, C as that ordering. So I'm just going to put them in order. Uh, so we have a probability mass function that gives 0 0.2 to A, 0 0.2 to B, 0 0.6 to C. I'll just write 0 0.2 to 0 0.26 as a sequence. Yeah? If you've never used Python before, uh, it's fine. Hopefully you understand this. You can type this. Yeah, it's very easy. Um, for gambles, um, so omega here is again my space. So Eric used small, lowercase f and lowercase g for these. I use uppercase x for gambles. This is just a convention. What I do, what I do follows more traditional probability theory uh, for the notation for random variables. Uh, but but both, both are fine. Um, so, so I will just write it also as a sequence. Okay, so this is just a gamble with values 5, 3, 1. 5 for A, 3 for B, 1 for C. So I never write my omega explicitly. It's at A, B, C. I just, it's just implicit there. I just decide on an ordering and I, I write it like that. Okay, so for expectation, so again, this is a formula that we saw yesterday that Eric gave yesterday for expectation of a random variable x under probability mass function p. Uh, what you do is you just, just may take the product of p of omega and x of omega over all omega, and then you sum all these numbers together. So you can do this in Python. This is just a very simple one-line uh, function, which is written here. Uh, I have done something here that you may not be familiar with. I have used type annotations in Python. I I think it clarifies my code, and I like doing it. If you're not familiar, if you know Python, but you're not familiar with that, you can completely ignore this. This isn't a fact execution of the code at all. It's just a, a part of the documentation. So here I'm explicitly stating that probability mass function and gambles need to be sequences of floats. Uh, so basically the notation I used before. So what this does, it takes these two sequences and turns them to a single sequence of pairs. That's what zip does. Uh, I take these pairs, I multiply them together, and I sum them, yeah? So this just is written in code what this formula is, yeah? It just, you see this product here, you see the sum here, and then there's some magic, weird magic that's happening to, to make it all work. Put everything together with the zip function, okay? You don't have to understand this completely, but hopefully you recognize the computational elements of the formula in the code. That's the important thing, okay? So... For example, we can calculate the expectation of 0.0.2 uh, 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 of, 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 sorry, of this gamble, 531, with respect to this probability mass function, 0.0.2, 0 0.6, 0 .0 and I get 0 0.2, yeah? And you can check this. So if I do 0 0.2 times 5, 0 plus 0 0.2 times 3, plus 0 0.6 times 1, I get the same value, yeah? And what Collab does, it allows you, so if I make a change here, for example, if I write 4 here, you can do this. I run this again, I get a different value, yeah? So I got no 0 0.2. So it allows you to make changes in the code, that's why I do this, okay? So um, we can go count, oh, it says condition, that should be just expectations. Uh, so let's do some exercise. I'll give you like uh, 30 seconds to try this for yourself. So calculate the expectation of this gamble with respect to this probability mass function, okay? Try to see if you can do that. And you can just copy paste this thing and then make some changes and then write the code here, and then verify that the value is 0 0.2. Okay, I'll give you 30 seconds to do that. Does anybody have an answer? If you can nod. Yes, so it is not 0 0.2. Okay, so I, this is intentional. I wanted you to find this. So if you do this, I'm going to quickly do it for you. So if you didn't manage to do this, just follow along with what I'm doing. So I'm just going to copy-paste, you know, that's like how 
modern children do their homework. Uh, uh, sorry, it's the burdens of modern parenthood again. Um, so you do this. Actually, it's meant, you're meant to copy-paste this. Okay, it's exactly what you're meant to do. So I don't get 0 0.2. Oh, damn, what happened here? Float fail, yes, float fail. So what is happening? Can you explain? It's an approximation, yes. So, so real numbers are not, uh, even, even like, even fractional numbers are not exactly representable uh, uh, by floats. So we have a sequence of floats and this floating point I would make, and it's different. So there is a slight error. Now here the error is really, 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 really small. Yeah. Um, the reason I wanted you to have this, and I doctored this example exactly to get this, um, is that we will need to account for this uh, error when you do coding. And this will happen, there will be some tolerance constant that I will introduce later. So this will not affect this sheet, but in the following sheets they will have a tolerance that is quite important that you take into account. Yeah, uh, but you don't need to worry too much about this. So they will, I will, I will show you how you do this correctly, um, and it will be very basic and simple. There's, in fact, the way I do it is correct for what we're doing. But I should do it in a, a proper code would do it in a better way. Um, but uh, but uh, we will still need to take account of that. So there's something to be aware of. Okay. So let's look at the optimal Walt strategies. So here I've um, um, introduced some like uh, types. So again, if you don't do Python with type annotation, you don't need to care about this. But this is a declaration, basically. I have my parameter, which can take values low or high. This is a wave height that I don't know for the next hour. I have my data, which can, again, low or high. This is the height from the last hour. I have my decision, which is a boat or no boat. And then I have a strategy, which is a function from the data to the decision. Yeah, so these are just annotations uh, that I've introduced, and uh, you don't need to worry about this too much, okay? So then I've defined my function, so my utility is function of decision and a parameter, and these are just the values here from the table, yeah? So I hope this code is very understandable, even if you've never seen Python before. I hope this uh, is kind of, uh, you can figure out. So for example, if you take the boat and the parameter is low, you get three, yeah, you make a gain. If you take the boat, but the wave height is high, you make a loss, and otherwise, you, there's nothing that happens, yeah? Um, all right, so similar, I've done this for the likelihood, and I've done this for the prior. Yeah, I have some functions that are present these, and I've written these functions down. There should also be a float here, I see some things missing here. But then we had a walled expected utility. This is a formula from the lectures, and I've implemented this. So this is just calculating the expectation of a random variable, so this is a random variable in y. So x is fixed here. This is a fixed constant. So this is a function of y when x is fixed. And this is my distribution of y. So this is just my likelihood. So I've calculated here the PMF as a sequence in y. I've calculated my gamble, which is this, applying this utility function. Uh, again, as a, as a sequence in y. And then I calculate the expectation. Yeah, it's just putting those things, that expectation function together with uh, these likelihoods and this utility, and it does the right thing. Does everybody kind of get this, or are there questions? Yeah, so this is just the computation. So uh, we can now define some strategies as well. So I, here I've taken a strategy as a parameter. I'm thinking of feeding a function into as an argument of another function. I love doing this. I love functional programming. Uh, you may not be used to this, but I'm just, I'm just like that. I just like doing that. So I've defined here some strategies. So this strategy here is, remember, strategy is just a function of data that gives back a decision. So I can decide always take the boat regardless of the data. Yeah. I can decide never to take a boat, regardless of the data. I can decide to take the boat if the data is high, yeah, if the wave height uh, is high in the last hour, otherwise not to take the boat. Um, I can also do it if it's low. Yeah? So I have four strategies that I can formulate. These are all the strategies in the problem. I've just defined them as four functions. Um, so, uh, and then what I've done... I've just simply called, calculated the walled expected utility. So this function I wrote here, which I called walled expected utility, I'm calling this on every combination of strategy and parameter. So I'm getting back a function of the parameter, and I've done this here, and here are the outcomes. Yeah. So, um, so what can you tell? 
first of all, there's some floating point stuff happening. You see this 0 0.3 0.0004, so this obviously is equal to 0 0.3, uh, but that's one thing you can see, but you can see something more. So remember what Wald says, you should not take a decision that's whose Wald expected utility is dominated for all x by some other one. So I'm gonna tell you that this one, take the boat if the wave height from the last hour is high, is dominate, is a bad decision. You kind of probably knew that already anyway. Right? It seems like a decision you shouldn't take. Uh, if the wave height from the last hour is high, it's likely to stay that way. Uh, it's a bad idea. Um, so can you tell this from these walled expected utilities that are given here? How can you tell this? Can you convince me? Can you explain this to me? Can someone tell me? Yeah, so you see this 2.7 is larger than 0 0.3 and minus 0 0.3 is larger than minus 0 0.7, yeah? So this one is dominated by this one. So this one is definitely a bad idea, yeah? Okay, so I just confirmed that. What about the other ones? Is there any other dominance here or not? I see some people nodding, there's no other dominance. So we've calculated the wall admissible strategies, yeah? So I've not done the code for actually calculating the maximum ones, but we can just tell by looking at the numbers. We do, we're going to do some code for doing the maximum ones explicitly uh, later. But for now, this is, this is certainly good enough. Okay, so all other strategies are admissible, yeah? So that's one thing. So if you do now look at optimal uh, base strategies, uh, we can do a similar thing. So I can calculate the posterior probability mass function. I showed you this formula earlier, so I just do this calculation here. I'm not going to spend much time explaining this, but it's kind of, yeah, it's pretty obvious how this works. So it calculates the posterior. I can calculate the posterior expectation. So now I, instead of a strategy and an X, I give a decision and a data point. Yeah, so it's a different kind of function. Uh, but I do the same thing. I calculate the probability mass function. That's just the posterior. I calculate the utility now as a function of x, no longer a function of y. Uh, and then I calculate expectations. This is a bit simpler than a previous function. And when I do that, I can again uh, calculate for every combination of data and decision point, I can calculate the posterior expected utility and I get just these single values. So this is a bit simpler than the base admissibility thing. So what is the optimal strategy that comes out of this? Can someone tell me if you look at these numbers? So I need a decision when data is low and I need a decision when data is high. What should I do when, data, when, the, when the data says low? Take the boat, why is that? Yes, you have a higher value, so you should take the boat. If the data is high, the highest value is when you take no boat. Okay, so that means one of the walled admissible strategies here is in fact this Bayes optimal strategy. Yeah. Okay. So um, so that is pretty cool. And now there's a little exercise, and I will just show you how it works. I will not spend much time. I'm already way behind time. I'm sorry, but I rather take my time to do this. Um, so. Um, uh, so we use the prior here, 0 0.4, 0 0.6, to find this strategy. So we can repeat these calculations for 0, 1, uh, and, oh yeah, this should be 1, 0, my apologies. This should be all the way around, so I have a typo here. Um, and you're going to find some other strategies, and you should confirm that these are the uh, walled admissible strategies. This will be one of the exercises you can do later. Yeah? Okay, so uh, just bear in mind there's a typo here. This should be one zero not zero one. Uh, hopefully that's obvious. Um, okay, so yes. <laughs> what did the two numbers were? <laughs> ah, the numbers in the boat strategies. You mean these numbers or? The walled ones, ah, uh, so, ah, this here, ah, okay. So yeah, so so I'm iterating over x here. So the two number, this is the walled expected utility for x is low. This is the walled expected utility for x is high. Yeah, that's that's so that's so I've decided on an ordering for the x, and they're just in the ordering that I've specified before. 
And if I do 4x in param, it will do it in exactly the ordering that I've specified. So it will be first, low, then high. Yeah? But they're all in the same order. Actually, it doesn't matter for comparing which order they are, as long as it's consistent between each uh, thing. But yes, that's a good question. Yeah, that's what they mean. Um, thank you for asking that. Any other questions? No? All right. Okay, so very good. So I'm going to continue uh, with my presentation now. So this, you have one exercise to do uh, by editing the code. So it will be very easy to do this. You just change these values and then you do run the entire thing and you will get different values at the end. That was what we have to do. Okay. So, um, so what I want to do is, so we see now there's like uh, an equivalence between frequent statistics and doing... Um, Bayesian statistical sets of priors. Yeah, there's kind of an equivalence with that. Uh, so, so what I want to do is develop this decision-making directly from sets of distributions. I think this, when you see this Wald result, it's a good argument for uh, doing that. And then I will look at some practical examples. All right, so let's... Uh, okay, I'm 20 minutes behind. It's fine. Um, okay, so... Can we develop a decision tree based on partial knowledge of probabilities? So a simple setting, I'm going to use the setting that Eric also used. He used the letter C for this. Um, I, I'm going to use the letter M for this. It's just, you can see both uh, used in the literature. This is what you'll see if you read Wally. Um, uh, but uh, yes, just a notational thing. So I'm having probably a set of probability mass functions, my creedal set. Uh, we have s gambles as functions of omega. So these are my random rewards expressed on a utility scale. And then the question is how we should choose among gambles. And I'll show you a specific example to exemplify that a bit. Um, so I have expectation formula here. We have a lower and upper expectation as well that we have seen. So I think Eric used inf and soup, but these sets are always finite and everything I will, almost everything I will do, they will be finite. Uh, so I'll just write min and max. Yeah, that's what they, they are, lower and upper expectation. So um, let's start with an example. So we have uh, a company making a product and they believe maybe future demand might increase, but I'm not so sure. Uh, and uh, we have some options uh, and the options we have is buy new machinery, Use overtime or do nothing. Yeah? So these are the three options that we have. We have to be choose between these three things. Uh, and then, again, for simplicity, demand can either increase or remain the same. That's a, an assumption that we make. Uh, and then uh, we have some profits that are specified. So if you buy new machinery, uh, if the demand increases, profit will be 440. Otherwise, it will be 260 because we've made this investment. Uh, if we use overtime, the profit will be a bit less to 420 if demand increases, but 300 otherwise, because using overtime is less expensive than buying new machinery. Uh, otherwise, if we do nothing, the profit will be remain at uh, 370 regardless of what we do. Yeah, And then we have some judgment. Uh, demand will increase with a probability between 0 0.5 and 0 0.8. So I'm going to represent it with just two probability mass functions. Ideally, I would have the whole range and a convex set, but this will matter for almost nothing, but at some point it will matter. Uh, but for now, let's just go with a creedal set with just these two elements. Yeah? So I'm just using the, what we call the extreme points of this set, and I will use this as a representation, um, just for computational reasons uh, at this point, and hopefully this won't affect things too much, and it won't except in one case. So, uh, but don't worry about that yet. So each column here is a probability mass function and we need to ask about the advice we can give to the manager. So the first thing I'm gonna do is extract from this description the gambles. So for example, you have here 440 if demand increases and 260 otherwise. Um, this is a function of increase or stay. This is a gamble, yeah, that gives me utilities. So, um, and I can do this for each Decisions. So I have my decisions, machine, overtime, nothing. I can translate this into a set of gambles yeah, that I have listed here. Uh, for 40 to 60, for 20, 300, or the constant uh, 370. Uh, and then what we're going to do, we're going to take this, apply something that's called as a choice function, to select a subset of these that we deem uh, okay that we do all right, for which we don't have an argument not to do them. Um, and that will, we call that optimal gambles, but that's just a name. Yeah, it's just a name for this. That's the things that we deem to be okay. And that gives us, of course, 
we can translate this back to decisions. Okay, so that's the general scheme of things that's what we're going to do. And the question is, what is a good choice function? So let's uh, let's go and uh, look at that a bit more detail. So let's um, yeah. So uh, we, I think we can do two of them and then do some exercises uh, or sort of break uh, and then move on later. Um, so the first one is called Gamma Maximin. So this goes back, actually Walt himself has uh, studied this. That's uh, a nice uh, coincidence. Uh, Gilboa and Schmeider have also used this, and many people have kind of studied this in various ways. Um, so the idea is to look at the lower expectation of the utility. So we're going to be a bit like pessimistic about our forecast, and we're going to assume the kind of worst case probability mass function is going to uh, obtain uh, regardless of what we do. And if you assume that, so that's kind of risk-averse attitude, um, it makes sense to maximize this lower expectation. Yeah? So that's one thing you can do. So it's very simple. How do you do that? We're going to set up the table. We're going to calculate the expectation for each gamble and probability mass function combination. From this, we can calculate the minimum expectation of each gamble, and then we decide the decision with the highest minimum expectation. So if you want a formula for this, this is what we're going to do. Yeah, We're going to find the arg max, so that means the argument, the d, for which this is maximized. Yeah, That's what arg max means. Uh, so let's, let's do this on a, on a practical example. Um, so, for example, if I look at this here, uh, let me just try to... Right on this, yeah, that should work. So um, let me maybe um, can I? Yeah, that's good. Uh, so for example, what is the expectation of 440 to 60 with respect to a half a half? Can someone tell me what is that? Three fifty? Yeah. Okay. Very good. So this is a similar exercise we did yesterday, right? So what is it for this one? What should I write here? 360. And the last one, 370. Yes, very good. This was the, the easiest one. Uh, for the other one, you can do it as well. Uh, I'm not going to torture you. Uh, we will have code to do it, unless someone can tell me immediately, but it's a bit of an annoying calculation here to do by to in your head. But it's 404, uh, 396, and this one you can do probably. That's also 370. Okay, so I've calculated for every combination of gamble here, these are the rows, and probability mastering, these are these columns, I've calculated a number. Uh, I can then find the lower expectation of this first gamble, which is 350 again, yes. Uh, for the next one, it's 360. Next one is 370. So what you see is something special, is that this lower expectation is always obtained for P1. That is not always going to be the case, right? Okay, this is just a coincidence of this problem. Uh, so now I want to find the gamma maximin decision. What is the gamma maximin decision? So I need to find the decision which maximizes the lower expectation, which is here the third option. Yeah? Okay, so this is the one. All right? That's gamma maximin. So if you don't want to code at all, if you want to avoid coding at all uh, later, so we're going to do, I, I don't want you to do these calculations by hand, but if you want, you can do a lot of the exercises just like this. Uh, that's just a backup option for you. Okay? So that's one way of making a decision. Uh, now, uh, another way is to do gamma maximum max. It's very similar, so gamma maximum seems very uh, pessimistic, and it's kind of the natural risk aversion way of doing things, but maybe you want to be very optimistic uh, and, um, uh, and choose a gamble whose upper expectation. So, suppose that nature always works in your favor, yeah? Uh, so, uh, you do the same thing. But now we calculate the maximum expectation of each gamble, and you find the one with the maximum, uh, uh, highest maximum expectation. So uh, let's do this again. So I've put these values here for you. So now the maximum expectation for the first gamble. Again, we have these two expectations. So the maximum is this value here, 404, and then whoops, and then three. 
0.96 for the second one. Yeah, again, the maximum of these two values. The maximum of these two values is just 370. Whoops. There you go. And we see that the maximum now is achieved here for a different, um, a different decision. Okay, oops, those things are disappearing. My apologies for that. Um, so that's, um, that's going to be the decision here. Um, okay, so we get a slightly different uh, decision if we do gamma maximin. Um, so let me, yeah, I don't know, say, try to save this. Yeah, there we go. Oops, I don't know why. I'm sorry, my app is doing strange. It doesn't want to put this error there. All right, so that's just a different decision. So that's kind of interesting, right? Depending on whether you're optimistic or pessimistic, you get different things. But uh, what we don't quite have here is indecision, yeah? Can we use both of these values at the same time? And this becomes uh, a bit tricky, and we'll see various ways uh, of doing that. And I think uh, I'm right on time for a break here, uh, and I think this is... Uh, yeah, wow, <laughs> I was way ahead, uh, and uh, we're going to take a break here, and we're going to return to this uh, at the next, uh, in 15 minutes. Okay, thank you. Okay, let's continue. I think most people are uh, organized and seated in the right place. Thank you for uh, accommodating this, it's uh, much appreciated. Um, so, as we were saying at the end, we've seen these two decision create criteria, gamma maximin, which is basically... Assuming the worst case, we have gamma maxi max, which is assuming the best case. Uh, can we do something that somehow covers both? And uh, which, as I remember from this quote from Katie Leung, uh, Harry Potter's first uh, girlfriend, um, um, uh, the ability to model indecision, I think, is very valuable. Yeah, it's very valuable because it allows us to, to, to manage this uncertainty in a better way. And this is exactly what we're going to get to here. So, and we've seen this a little bit already with Wald. We had these, these different strategies, and we just picked the maximum ones, and these were incomparable. There was a partial ordering involved, and uh, there was some indecision about We had multiple uh, solutions. So we're going to get this back, and the, f the kind of very simple idea instead of just using the lower bounds or just using the upper bounds, is to use both of these bounds at the same time. And the idea is to look at uh, the, each gamble will have an interval expectation. A lower and an upper we consider as an interval, and we can compare these intervals. Yeah, this is the first very simple idea. And uh, this is called, uh, I'm going to call this interval maximality, uh, because uh, it's maximality with respect to an ordering. I like this name. Uh, you will usually hear this uh, being talked about as interval dominance or things, something similar. Yeah, But I'll call it, ma it's a maximality criterion still, so I'll call it interval maximality uh, here. So the idea is to pick those options whose interval Interval is undominated, and this is the like formal definition of these orderings and stuff. But I'm going to show this on a picture because it's a bit clearer. Um, so, <clears throat> this, if you look at uh, different decisions uh, like D and E here, they each have their interval, and clearly this interval lies below this one, so this one dominates this. But here, these intervals overlap. So here, there's no dominance here. There's no ordering. I can't compare these. These are incomparable because I don't know where the expectation here is going to fall. Of course, I could compare by the middle points, but that's a different thing. Yeah, that's a different thing. Actually, that's also a criterion which I will not cover here in the lectures, but it's part of the exercises that you can do. This has a different name, uh, but I'll not cover it uh, directly with you. It's something you can do as part of the exercises if you want. Um, here again, you have that D dominates E, and here again, one is wider than the other. Uh, this is incomparable, all right? Okay, so that's how this ordering kind of works. So let's have a look at uh, an example. So this is a hypothetical example. It has nothing to do with the decision problem with the three options here. We have many more gambles. You have uh, uh, six of them. Um, so uh, we want to find the maximal elements. Okay, so let's go one by one and calculate them kind of in a sequential way. So, uh, and the way that you find um, uh, maximal elements, like in general, the kind of theoretical way to do that, is to draw a Hasse diagram. And I believe Gert is also going to make use of that uh, later, isn't that right, Gert? Um, yeah. Um, so so, so you, you may want to try to remember this until uh, Thursday. Uh, is that one, or is it, is it Thursday? Yes. Um, 
So I'm going to start with the first option. So I have just this one, yeah? And then I consider the second one. Is there dominance between these two? No, okay? So I'm just going to put two next to it. Um, I look at the third option here. Is there dominance? You have to look carefully. There is no dominance. You can just see, it looks like maybe this one dominates this one, but it doesn't. You look, look, this, this upper bound is still higher than this lower bound. It's just really tiny, but the intervals do overlap by the tiniest of amounts, and therefore, there is no dominance, yeah? So we've got three. Then I have four. Does four dominate some of these intervals? Uh, which ones? One and two, yeah? Okay, so what I'm gonna do, I'm gonna put four on top, and then I'm going to put some arcs to where they dominate. Yeah, so I'm just putting them above, and above means they dominate uh, if there is a, an arc between them. Uh, then I look at five. Is there dominance from five with any of the other options? It's dominated, yes, by, by three and four, very good. Okay, so I write this. And then I have six. Is there any dominance between six and any of the others? No. Okay, so I have this Hasse diagram. And the maximal elements are the ones that are undominated. Which ones are these? Four, three, and six. Yeah, so four is not dominated, three is not dominated, six is not dominated. Yeah, that's what we have. Um, so this is laborious, yeah, in general to do this. I mean, this was a small example. We did this fairly quickly, but to draw the Hasse diagram to do this is a, a bit tedious. Uh, and in fact, we can um, do this much more quickly. So uh, I've just drawn them here, the uh, one. So what you notice, there's something that is happening here, something special. So can someone tell me where, which of these lines, I'm gonna call them one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, 10, 11, and 12, I have 12 lines. Which of these lines is, corresponds to the one that has the highest lower bound for all these options? It's not one. Just shout if I say it. Two. Is someone shouting? No, okay. Three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine. nine. Yeah, nine. Yes, okay, very good. That's the one. So if you look at this, you can see that if I look at this one, the, the non maximal ones all lie, are exactly the ones whose upper bound lies below that. Yeah? You might think this is a coincidence. In fact, it is not. It is a theorem. Yeah, it's a result. So in general, you can always, the only thing you need to do is calculate the uh, highest lower bound and then check which ones have an upper bound that's lower than that. And that's it. Okay, so you don't have to draw the Hasse diagram. One of the coding exercises is uh, to first not assume that and do maximality the, in, in the computer in the inefficient way by comparing everything with everything. Uh, and then to implement this theorem in code and then check you get the same results. Yeah, this is one of the exercises for you. Uh, but uh, this is in practice what you're gonna do. Okay, so uh, how do we do it? So I have a very quick uh, recipe for um, doing this. Um, we set up the table, the gambles and expectations. As before, we find out the both minimum and maximum expectation. Uh, and then we choose all the decisions whose maximum expectation exceeds the overall largest minimum expectation. Now, this largest minimum expectation, this is gamma maximin, yeah? So you do first do gamma maximin, like before, like the very first thing we did, and then you just look at the upper bounds that, uh, uh, that are exceeded by that, and those are the non-maximal ones, the rest are the maximal ones, okay? So you just look at all the ones whose upper bound exceeds this uh, gamma maximin value, if you like, all right? So let's uh, quickly uh, do this. So uh, I can write down the lower and upper bounds. We've done this before, so let me write this down. Um, so uh, it's very easy here. It's just the first column and the second column. Again, this is a coincidence.
So the gamma maximin value, if you like, is this, which one, which is, oh sorry, I'm not going to tell you which one is it, what is the value that we're looking at, what's the highest lower bound? It's 370, yeah, you see this here, so if you look at the lower bounds, it's this one, the maximum value is here, so I look at this, and then I look at all decisions whose upper bounds are larger than this value. Uh, which ones are these? I'm going to show the definition again. Which ones are they? All of them, yeah? You see, all these numbers are larger than this. So in this case, I mean, this is very, I mean, this is a doctored example. It's not very uh, uh, exciting <laughs> in a way, but that's what you get in this example, yes? Yeah? So you can't basically, you can't tell. Uh, which one is, is, is the best, uh, based on the information that you have. It's because the information we have is quite weak. Uh, so you can see all our interval maximal. Because all these numbers are larger than uh, this uh, gamma maximin value. Yeah. So this I'm going to call this the gamma maximin value. So as part of doing this uh, interval dominance, you turn out you need to calculate the gamma maximin uh, gamble first, basically. That's the efficient way to do it. Uh, and if you look at the intervals, you can check this. So this interval is just a point. This interval is a little bit wider, and this interval is even wider. So you see these intervals actually nested, and nested intervals don't dominate each other. So therefore, yeah, this confirms the calculation. All right? Good. Uh, so, I mean, in particular, so it, it was a, a question about strict uh, inequality or not, but the maximin gamble is always going to be uh, interval maximal as a consequence of this. This is, again, one of the exercises to prove this, but it's just almost obvious. All right, any questions? No? All right, okay, so let's crack on. Um, so the next thing I'm going to look is at a slightly different way uh, to do things, which uh, actually is a bit closer to the walled admissibility that we've been looking at. So we're going to also look at an ordering, but I'm going to make the ordering a bit more refined. It's going to be a stronger ordering, and therefore there will be fewer uh, in this, uh, less indecisiveness. And it, um, you can interpret this in terms, you don't have to, but you can interpret this in terms of the behavioral interpretation of lower provisions that uh, uh, Eric has done. So this, this, this really touches on this uh, buying price interpretation of uh, the lower provision or lower expectation. Okay, so it refines uh, maximality and there's going to be an exercise, actually that three is not correct probably, but there is an exercise on this uh, later. Um, so we can say that X robust dominates Y, so X is bigger than Y, and we're not going to compare the lower and upper bounds of X and the lower bounds of Y, we're not going to compare the intervals, we're going to compare them kind of more directly. What I'm going to do, I'm going to calculate the lower expectation of the difference. Yeah, and if this is strictly positive, that means I'm I'm willing to pay something to get x in exchange for y, yeah, and that willingness to pay some strictly positive amount of money or utility, if you like, uh, to get x in exchange for y, that is an indication that behaviorally speaking, I prefer x to y. Yeah, I prefer these gambles. So this is just a different way of introducing an ordering. And one of the exercises, again, is going to be like, um, uh, if, I, if I have this or um, if I have interval dominance, that this will imply also this sort of dominance. And therefore, I'm getting this is kind of a, a better way of ordering them as a consequence. So um, this also means x minus y plus some epsilon, small amount, is desirable or is acceptable to you as a transaction. Um, so let's um, let's try to put this into uh, practice. So the equivalence of this, like behavior and patient, is simply assuming that, saying that for every probability mass function in my real set, the expectation of x is bigger than the expectation of y. Okay, this is not behavioral. This is just a sensitivity uh, interpretation of uh, this. Just robustifies the. This is how you would order. If you just had a single probability distribution and you would make decisions based on maximal expected utility, this is what you would do. 
so this basically just robustifies that ordering. Yeah, that's what happens here. So that's why this is called robust Bayes, if you want. Um, okay, so let's um, let's have a, a look at a hypothetical example. So in, again, an example that we have, it's a bit trivial, so I want to give a slightly more complicated example. So we need to choose any gamma which is undominated with respect to this ordering. So um, remember, we've already done partial orderings of vectors, and it's exactly the same thing that happens here. So here I have the vector of expectations, yeah? I want to I wanna choose the vectors that are pointwise uh, undominated, if you like. So I'm going to start with the first one. Uh, so, of course, that's just the first one. So is there dominance between x1 and x2 according to this uh, uh, criterion? And all I need to do is compare these values. So I can see that x1 dominates x2 under p1, under p3, oh, P2, that should be to P2, uh, there's, they're indifferent. Under P3, uh, X2 dominates X1. Yeah? So the ordering changes as I change the probability mass function, so therefore there's no dominance. Yeah? So I can put two here. Uh, is there any dominance between X3 and any of these two? Can someone tell me? X1 dominates X3. Yeah? Do you see that? So. This is larger than this, this is larger than this, this is larger than this. Yeah, so in all cases there's dominance. Uh, how about X4 and the previous ones? Again, X1 dominates it. Yeah, and also X3, but not X2. Yeah. So we have X1 and X2. So Here's something that is happening. Uh, this ordering, in fact, is transitive. So if it dominates, if x3 dominates x4, and I already know that x1 dominates x3, necessarily I must have that x1 dominates x4. Yeah? This transitivity is very, very important because it allows us to make for a more efficient algorithm where we don't have to compare every pair. But more about that later. Yeah? I just want to observe the transitivity at work here. Okay, how about... Uh, X5. X1, yes, it dominates X1. And not X2. So this is what we have. Yeah, so X5 dominates X1. So necessarily, I don't need to check anymore. I know it will dominate X3 and X4. Yeah, by transitivity, that's enough. And I, then I only left to compare x2 and x5, and that's what I have. So what are the maximal gambles here, the robust base maximal gambles? Two and five, yeah. What are the interval maximal gambles? Five and two are, there's uh, more. So what do I need to do? I need to draw these, think about the intervals that are all of them, yeah? So this is the interval minus one, one. This is just a point zero. This is the interval minus two to a half. This is the interval minus three to 0 0.2. This is the interval minus a half to two. Uh, you can see all these intervals, they all contain the point zero, yeah? They all overlap as a consequence, yeah? They all contain that one point. So there's no dominance happening here, yeah? Okay, I, I, this was a bit of a, yeah, uh, a question you had to think a bit about, but, uh, so you can see that, 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 so the demonstrate, what I want to demonstrate here is that you only have two maximal gamma, but everything's interval maximal, and this happens quite a lot, where interval maximality is a lot more imprecise, if you like, has a lot more indecision than robust based maximality. So, therefore, when you can, sometimes you can't, or it's very computationally very difficult, but when you can, you should try to use robust based maximality instead of interval max, uh, maximality. Yeah, that's just what is demonstrated here. All right, so, um, any questions about this? Yes. Can you speak up, please? I can't hear you. Why don't we have arrows? 
Uh, you can have arrows if you want. Yeah, that's just a convention. Yeah. Um, I'll just do it top down. That's, that's the convention. Any other questions? No? All right, good. So, um, something you can see here at work is that every non maximal element is dominated by a maximal element. Yeah? That's something you observe in this example. And if you think a little bit about this, uh, you should be able to prove this is always the case. Yeah, it's kind of for, for finite tree, if you have a finite set with a partial ordering that's transitive, then every uh, non maximal element will be dominated by, the, dominated by a maximal element. We already saw that with interval dominance. Yeah, we know that every non maximal element is in fact dominated by the same maximal element, namely by the gamma maximin decision. Yeah? That's not necessarily the case. There will be no unique one that dominates everything, but there will be some in general. So interval dominance is quite special in that respect uh, as an ordering. Uh, but uh, in general, for this uh, robust base maximality, you still have that. And for every or partial ordering, uh, you will have this also for the uh, uh, a walled admissibility, you can also apply this uh, principle. So you don't really need to find, the, the, you don't need to build a Hasse uh, diagram to find maximum elements. You can do this in a sequential way, and once a non-maximal maximal element is removed, you don't need to consider it further. Yeah? And one of the coding exercises is to kind of verify how you do that. I've coded this up for you but your job will be to an analyze this and convince yourself that this is correct. Um, so uh, if I do that, I can start with one, and then I have two. There's no dominance between those. Then I have three, yeah? I know three is dominated by x1, so I can just immediately remove x3, yeah? I know it's not going to be maximal. I can immediately remove it, so... Uh, there we go. I don't need to consider it any further. I can remove it. Uh, so I've done that here. It's no longer present. Then I have four. I see four is dominated by uh, one again. Yes, so I'll remove it again. Hup, it's gone. Yes, no longer in my table. And then I have to consider x5, and I see x5 dominates uh, x1. And there you go. And I have found the maximal element. Yeah? Okay, so you can do this more efficiently. You don't have to draw the full Hasse diagram to find maximality. You can do this in a sequential way. And you can implement this idea in a computer computationally uh, to get um, a more efficient way to find uh, maximal elements with respect to partial order. And this, this works for any ordering. You can do into interval maximality like this as well. But of course, we already have a much better algorithm for doing it. Um, but uh, uh, you could uh, do this for the... Uh, walled admissibility and for other orderings that you have. Okay, is that um, clear? Any questions about that? Good, okay, so this is a nice result. Again, the code will demonstrate this uh, for you. Um, so let's just do this. So what we do, we set up the table we'll, as before. We have these expectations, and then we sequentially remove decisions whose expectation rows are pointwise dominated. Uh, so if I do this in the example, it's a little bit boring. So I start with the first one, yeah. I compare with the second one, you see, this is larger than this, but this is larger than that, so there's no, I cannot remove anything. Then I have the next one, and then again you see there is no dominance going on between these rows, yeah. Um, so there's nothing I can remove, everything is maximal. So in this case, um, maximality and interval dominance coincide. In general, that's not the case but it does sometimes. Um, and you will see this at work, you will see examples later, uh, at, at near the end of the lectures, where you will notice uh, a difference happening in some classification problem. Okay, all right. Is that all? Um, any other questions about this? Good, okay, so let me write this down. So they're all robust base, oops. Maximal. Max. Maxim. Mal. Please let me draw a dot. No. Okay. Whatever. Um, okay. So there we go. Let's move on with the next one. So the last one is called the robust base admissibility. So there's yet another way 
to decide uh, on optimal gambles, which does not use uh, directly an ordering uh, between um, the gambles. Instead, what we're going to do is we're going to look at each of these probability mass functions in the credal set, and we're just going to say, what is the maximal element under each of these? So, for example, under P1, these are the same numbers as before. Under P1, what is the best decision? Can someone tell me? It's 5, yeah, because this is the largest expectation. Under P, it says P3, should be P2. What is the best decision? 5 again, yeah, this is the largest number. Under P3, what is the best decision? It's 2, yeah, because this is the largest number. Yeah, so uh, in this case, I've got just have I, yeah, I've indicated these numbers here. So it's clear x5 and x2 are the uh, uh, rows base admissible. So we have uh, 5 and I think it's because I'm putting my 2 are robust base. That's missable. Oh, yeah, sorry. I'm very bad with this. I really need a different software to annotate my PDFs. Uh, but anyway, okay. So this seems very easy in this example, yeah? So you would take, why would I care about this? In fact, this is even more refined than uh, the max robust base maximality. Yeah, it gives even a few lot smaller set. We'll see this at work in a moment. Uh, so here it's the same, but it can be smaller. We'll see an example in a moment. So the main downside of this is that typically this set M can be quite large, a set of extreme points. Remember we talked about duality and dual representations. So the representation in terms of uh, acceptable gambles is typically computationally much more efficient to work with. Uh, and if this set is very large, then yeah, you have a huge number of optimization problems to solve uh, and this can be quite uh, tricky. The other problem with this, uh, or something you just really need to be aware of, is that this is not, so I remember I said we're just going to use the extreme points in the example. Well, here it breaks down. If I take a convex hull, it changes. And I'm going to give you an example of this in a moment. Um, so let's look at um, doing this exercise for the problem we had. So if I look at P1, what's the optimal decision here under P1? It's nothing. Yeah. So I have this here. What's the optimal decision under P2? It's machinery. Yeah, this is the best one. So these are the optimal decisions. Now I'm going to do something. Uh, I'm going to add something, a P3 here. And actually, this lies in the convex hull of these two things. And again, it's an exercise, one of the exercises, to prove that it is, yeah? just using some code. It actually lies smack in the middle of these two. You can just do the calculation in your head. Uh, but uh, this, is, this is part of the convex hull of this. So. What's the optimal choice here? We already know that. Yeah, it's nothing. For the second one, it's machinery. And now under P3, if you do the calculation, oh, I get 377, 378, 370. So it's this one. So I've added something to the set that's in the convex hull, and I got an extra decision out. Yeah? Yeah, so... Uh, that's something to be aware of. Yeah. So what people typically do is take the con entire convex hull for this reason of the creedal set and then find the robust base admissible um, decision with respect to that. This is called e-admissibility. Yeah, this has its own name. Um, uh, and uh, that's what, what people generally do. This is something to be aware of. Yeah. Um, okay. So, uh, let me see what we have. Oh, I am right, well, more or less right on time, so we're going to do some exercises now just to put everything that you've seen here uh, in practice. So, um, so you can go back to, oh, it's back to Google Collab. Uh, you can do, I mean, there was one exercise here on a classical decision tree, which you can try uh, with the walled admissibility. So you can look at that one if you want, uh, or you can just jump straight into this one as well. It's all up to you. 
So remember, I said something about copy to drive to save your work. I suggest you click that. And then you do run all. Um, what, a few things, I just go over this very briefly just to show you what, what is going on. Uh, so you see this tolerance that I was talking about? We saw this uh, floating point stuff. There is a tolerance built in here, and I've just fixed the value to e to the minus 6. So uh, it's a uh, 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 um, uh, six, six zeros and then a 1. Uh, so it's a very small number, and that's enough for what we're doing here. Uh, so Creedle sets I'm going to represent through a sequence of probability mass functions. Yeah, that's the representation of a Creedle set. I then need to find lower and upper expectations with respect to it. So uh, expectation is as before. And then I have, sorry, I'm just a real fan of functional programming. So uh, what I've done is I've done, because this is useful, it's really useful for one of the exercises later to have this, I have a way of transforming these expectations uh, with respect to a Creedle set and a gamble. So I calculate the expectation of a gamble with respect to every probability mass function my Creedle set, and then I can transform this. The transform can be either a min, then I get a lower expectation, or a max, and then I get the upper expectation. But there are other, there are other transformations as part of the exercises. So uh, if you don't understand it, it's totally fine. Um, <laughs> it's totally okay. Don't worry about it. Anyway, this calculates lower and upper expectations. You can just do that as an exercise. Uh, here's an example. Um, uh, and it, uh, you can verify it. So you can go through there and you can calculate the lower expectation of this gamble. You can calculate the upper expectation. You can verify this relationship as well. We call this conjugacy that we saw yesterday with Eric. Uh, you can verify that this holds. So you can go through this. It shouldn't be difficult at all. Okay, we have gamma maximin, so I've written the code for you to do it. Um, and actually, I'm going to have max, maximin and maximax, so I just have a something here, and a something here can be a lower expectation or an upper expectation, or maybe even something else. Um, so this code does that for you. Again, you can go through this and try to understand it. If you don't, it's all right. Don't worry about it. Uh, the main thing is that you can run this code. Uh, notice, so there is some tolerance here, so this comparison, I need to compare the, um, the, the, the something value, which could be lower or upper expectations, so these are going to be lower expectations or upper expectations, with the maximum of them, and uh, that's why you have this tolerance here, yeah, because this calculation could make a small error. Um, so that takes care of that. And then this will give you back, so if I call this, this will give you back a sequence of Booleans, so false, false, true. What this means is that the first gamble is not gamma maximum, the second one is not gamma maximum, but the third one is. Yeah? So this confirms the calculation we did with this table and so on. We found that the third gamble was gamma maximum, and this is what it is. You do need to understand that. So if you understand nothing of Python and this code, it's totally fine as long as you understand that if you run this function, what this means, that's the most important thing. But if you know Python a little bit, and tr do try to understand what these functions do under the hood. I've, I've, I'm not high, there's no, I don't import any library. This is all just, you have all the code there, the full implementation is there, uh, and it's, it's, I think, quite simple. Um, so gamma maximax is the same thing. So the something now is the upper expectation. Uh, we just do the same thing, and again, if you don't understand this, this seems a bit weird. I'm defining function inside other functions. Oh my God, that's, what is that? Um, <laughs> um, so if you, if you find this very confusing, it's fine. Uh, the main thing is I understand what it does. So again, the first gamble was comma maximax. The other two were not. So that's what we find here. There's some other thing, Hurwicks, which I've not talked about. You can go through that or not. There's interval maximality. Again, there is a... Um, a function that compares these expectations, it compares the minimum expectation of the first sequence with the, the maximum expectation and the second sequence with some tolerance. So that is interval dom dominance that it checks. And then we just have a function that does maximality, so it finds all the non-dominated elements. Yeah, it's found all XS in my, sequ in my sequence of XSSs uh, that are not dominated, so it finds all non-dominated elements and returns that. So interval maximality is just returning 
the maximal elements with respect to this ordering that I've written in this function. And I'm going through this quickly, just I'm just talking about it. You're meant to go through this much more slowly when you do the exercises. Um, so you should try to explain what these things are, and if, I think I've just said it. Uh, they correspond to these values here, yeah. Um, and then you can also do robust base maximality by just changing the order. So the code is exactly the same. I've just changed this ordering, yeah. Same implementation uh, for here, uh, and then you have robust base maximality admissibility. Sorry, which is more magic stuff happening, which I will not explain, uh, but it, you can just check it gives you the correct solution. So we saw that robust base, it was just a first and a last gamble. And again, you find that. Uh, and then there's some additional exercises that you can do. Um, if you have time, uh, hopefully hopefully you have, and I'll be walking around around these. So this is just with a different creedal set, the same thing. It's a different problem. Um, and, and there's like way more. You can try to implement um, uh, this improvement in the code, which I have told you about, that you don't need to consider all the uh, pairs, and this is what it does. Again, um, the code is there. I, I doubt many people will get there, but if you do, um, uh, you can. Uh, and then there's much more stuff. And then for uh, the real like champs, um, you can prove Walt's theorem. Uh, <laughs> and there's weird stuff happening there, there. so, uh, but I know Eric will manage to do it for sure. Uh, <laughs> um, yeah, there's weird stuff happening there with decision making because we have data. I've not talked about data here very much, uh, but it shows that Wald's theorem is a statement about normal form robust base maximality. That's uh, quite complicated. So um, I think that's enough uh, for me to talk about. Uh, so I think we have like about 20 minutes or something uh, to end on a break. Is that correct? Yeah. So I'll let you work on this for 20 minutes. I'll walk around. If you have questions, please do ask. Uh, and then, uh, so for the second part, it will be a bit more theory and then more exercises. And then you can choose if you want to continue with these or if you want to do a whole other set of exercises that involves some machine learning. Uh, you can just do whatever you uh, want also this so don't try to do everything i don't think you can uh, just pick those exercises that you find more most interesting and uh, the rest you can do even after the school like even like six months from now if you go through it you say oh actually yeah, i remember this i should look at this if you have questions about this uh, please you can always contact me like even 10 years from now, you say, oh, yeah, by the way, uh, this wall theorem, how, was it, how did that proof work? Um, yeah, so you, you, can, you can always ask me questions about that. Okay, so I'll be walking around, and uh, if you have any questions, please do ask, and I'll let you go through this at your own uh, pace. Okay. All right, let's uh, crack on. So, um, uh, so there will be more exercise. If you just sit the same place as before, things will work nicely. Uh, so I want to look at some, uh, apply all of everything we've seen so far. I want us to apply this to a uh, problem in machine learning. Okay, so we're going to look at classification. Uh, and uh, so here's a, is a brief introdu introduction. We have an actual class that we don't know. So think, for example, about spam filtering. Yeah, so the, cla the class is going to be, is this email spam or not? Yeah, for example. The attributes might be, whether certain words appear in this email. So I might, for example, does the word uh, money appear in my email? Does uh, the word uh, university appear in my email? And the appearances of these words might be informative uh, to as to whether this email is spam or not. Yeah? So that's kind of a situation I'm imagining, and we'll look at a different sort of problem later, but that's kind of situation I'm imagining. So I have an actual class that is unknown, which I call C, and then we have some attributes, a set of attributes, A1 to AK, so a K of them, uh, that we do know, that we do observe. So we observe the email, but we may not know the class. Um, we need to decide on what the class is. So that's the decision. So the decision is going to be, is this spam, is this not spam? Yeah. And then there is a utility function here. So the way that we construct our gamma is through utility function for deciding the class is D, if the real class is C. Yeah? So D and C might coincide or they might not. Uh, and one simple way to, to do this decision making is simply saying, if they coincide, utility is one. 
And if they don't, utility is zero. But you might imagine uh, other utility functions. So for example, for, for spam filtering, you might think classifying an email as spam uh, when it's not, that's quite bad because it might go into the spam folder and I might miss it. Uh, so I'd rather have a little bit more spam in my inbox uh, to avoid that from happening. Yeah, so, so that could be a reasonable thing to do. And also in the application that we'll look at, actually, there maybe you shouldn't use specifically this utility function. But just to make things easy, here we're just going to use this utility function. I'm just saying you have options. You have more options than what I'm going to present uh, here. So if you do this, yeah, which is sensible in many cases, but not always, um, if you try to find the best uh, class uh, given the attributes, so that's your decision. The optimal decision is going to be the one that maximizes the expected posterior utility. Yeah, so this is uh, not something that uh, we've seen before, but this comes from statistics. And if you do uh, some manipulations, you can see this is the same uh, thing, and this, this is because this is somehow easier to handle. Uh, it's the same thing as simply maximizing, uh, finding the class that maximizes the joint probability of seeing the class and the attributes. Yeah, but here A will be fixed. It will be actual observation, but you can just fix it in there. And that's generally what we're going to look at because it's just easier to handle. You could look at this conditional as well, uh, but it's just a bit more work to get at it. Uh, you need to apply Bayes' theorem and do all sorts of fractions and stuff like that. And uh, we don't have to do that here. We're basically getting rid of the normalization constant, which is... Uh, this thing here. Yeah, so I'm dropping this term. Um, so the main problem that you have, so this is a basic setup. How do you estimate this joint probability? Uh, and how do you deal with, say, scarce data if you don't have a lot of data? And because we have many attributes, so maybe certain attribute class combinations are quite rare. Uh, how do you deal with that? And also dealing with missing data is a very common thing. I will not talk too much. About, actually, I will not really talk about that. But this, this can also be dealt with in a very elegant way using probability bounding. I just want to mention that because uh, it's a, a fantastic application. And Gert and uh, Marco have written a very nice uh, paper precisely on this. Uh, topic, and this is just commonly used these days. It's very common. Um, so let's start with just a classical treatment of this problem. So uh, what we normally do, we make a very like unrealistic but useful assumption. Yeah, and the unrealistic assumption is that the attributes are independent given a class. Yeah, so that means, for example, the context of spam filtering. I'm basically in the occurrence of. Uh, certain words, uh, this, they, 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 they're not correlated. And of course, I know that the car, if, if, if car happens, then A or V is quite likely to happen together with it. So these, uh, these obviously, these attributes are not, uh, occurrence of words are not going to be independent, but it's kind of useful to do. And the reason to do it is because it reduces the number of probabilities that we have to estimate. Yeah, so it's just a statistical modeling trick, if you like to reduce the complexity of the problem. And um, you might say that's a very bad thing, but it turns out that classifiers still work remarkably accurate, even if this assumption is wildly violated. Yeah, and the reasons for that, which I will not go into, I'm just mentioning it, uh, because you might be very worried that we suddenly bring in this independence assumption without any justification. Uh, and in general, in fact, there is a lot of justification for not bringing it in, but the justification here is not because it's realistic, it's just because it simplifies the computations and it reduces the amount of data you need to make uh, decisions here. Okay, so we're just going to go and run with this and just assume it, even if we know it's not quite true. Um, so then the problem, instead of estimating this joint, which is of a very, very large object, um, we only have to estimate a marginal on the classes. And for every class, we need to find, also find a marginal on each attribute. Yeah, so we have simplified this problem quite a lot. And uh, you can use maximum likelihood estimates for these uh, probabilities. And if you do that, you just find the relative frequency. So I have some notation here. This n, big n, is just the total number of observations. This n of c is just the number of times I've observed the class c. Okay, so this is to the relative frequency that I see the, the class c. That's p of c. That's my maximum likelihood estimate. And similarly, I can do this for this conditional probability. It's just the number of times I see a, i, and c together, divided by the number of times I see the class c. Yeah, and that's uh, that's what it is. 
Uh, now, um, there's a way to, you might be worried what happens if some of these numbers are very low or even zero. So, for example, if some attribute class combination does not appear at all, and this, can, this happens actually quite commonly, um, immediately if I plug that in, regardless of anything else, as soon as that happens, this probability is going to be zero. Yeah? So I'm suddenly it wipes out all the other information I have. Yeah, you don't want that to happen. That's not so good. So people try to smooth this out a little bit. And one way is to use the Dirichlet the prior. And Eric has kind of hinted at this uh, a little bit. Uh, he's not giving you the full formula for the precise Dirichlet prior. But what you get from the predictive end is very similar to the forms you saw last time, except this is now precise. It's not an interval. Uh, but uh, we're going to introduce pseudo observations. So I'm going to assume I have s extra observations in my data, of which s times t of c, so a fraction t of c, r of class c, okay? And a fraction, so this number needs to be less than this, so, and a fraction of those t a i c is class c together with attribute a i, yeah? And of course, these pseudo observations are now allow for a fractional number of observation or even like uh, a real, <laughs> I mean, these, these, these don't, don't need to be integers at all, yeah? And this may seem really weird as an idea, but it makes computationally, it makes a lot of sense, yeah? Uh, and it's just an interpretation. There is a whole uh, model behind this, and you can, you can interpret this in a Bayesian way, but I don't want to go into this, and I'm very happy with how Eric has explained things, and it's basically the same thing. Uh, so uh, there's some constraints. Obviously, these the, I need to observe some class, so these need to sum to one. Uh, if I sum these things, that it's also on TFC. That's the similar. If I sum these counts here together over all possible attribute values, I must get the number of times I observe the class C. Uh, so these mimic the same constraints, uh, and that's that's what happens. Okay, so don't worry too much about that. There's an exercise later. Uh, actually, in the project, you will, if you decide to do this part of the project. This will become important, but for now, it's just a model, and I'm just specifying things. Uh, you can think about it later if it uh, matters for the project. Um, but so um, the problem is that now we have to specify, if you do this, you have to specify these t values. And there's quite many of them, and it's not so clear how you would do that. Yeah? Maybe for spam filtering, you can get some idea of how much spam you see generally. So for the t of c's, Maybe actually you could specify a value, uh, but for saying how often do you see a certain word in combination with spam and in combination with non-spam, that might be actually quite tricky and difficult. Um, so maybe this, this is difficult, and this is a very large specification still, uh, and you don't maybe want to do that. So what we're going to do is we're going to do a sensitivity analysis, and we're going to vary these t values. And we're going to recover the formulas that Eric was showing, more or less. Um, so let me, uh, I think I just said all this. So what I want to do is do that, do sensitiveness over these Ts. And then we're going to try to use these decision criteria that we discussed. And in particular, I want to focus on interval dominance here, right now. But in the project, you will also think about robust base maximality and uh, even robust base admissibility. You'll see this is, actually, you're going to think about it and see that this is uh, impossible, yeah? Um, this is very hard um, to do. Um, but, um, okay, so let's, um, let's move on with this. So if I want to find, so remember, we need to look at the joint distribution of C and A to find this, max, this or the, to solve this classification problem. So uh, let me show it again. So it's this thing that we need to do. So instead of maximizing this probability, we're going to find the maximal probability intervals. We're going to have intervals for this thing, and we're going to apply interval maximality on that. Yeah, That's the basic idea. That's uh, not how it's normally implemented, but it is very easy uh, to do, and it's very easy to explain, and we can move on from there to look at maximality as well in the project. Um, so I'm just giving you the formulas. So, so now my joint probability is a function of this T of C and T of A, I, C, and I've just written T here, but it's a very large vector of all of these. And I need to take the infimum over all these Ts. So S, there's another parameter here. S, 
I consider that fixed. So this is exactly the same situation as what Eric was describing. We fixed this parameter. And then there was a question someone asked about how do we choose this S? What impact does this have? You'll investigate this as part of uh, the exercises in a moment. So this is the big expression. And it's, uh, this uh, looks a bit unpleasant if you want to optimize this, what you can see, I can, if I say want to minimize this, uh, I can set T of C, I can let that converge to zero. I get this here for this term. And for these terms, I'm actually going to let this converge to one and this to zero. Yeah, I just optimize them independently. Yeah, of course, <laughs> I, I'm choosing different T of C values here and there. So this is going to be an approximation. So I'm not using exact I'm using wider intervals than I have to, yeah? So I'm going to get more imprecision. I'm going to get more undominated maximal elements than I need to. But it's just very easy to do, yeah? And again, in the project, you will fix this problem. But for now, we're just going to run with that and use this. And what you can see, this is a very nice, because now my formula is simply, for the joint, is simply the lower bound of, of the probability of C times the product of the lower bounds on the probability of AI given C. Yeah, this is a, just a nice formula. But this is not exact, yeah? This is not exact, but that's what we're going to use. We're going to use this non-exact approximation. Uh, and of course, if, if uh, n becomes large, and if s is not too large, this will we'll make an error that is not too bad. Uh, but it could be bad in certain circumstances. Uh, for the upper bound, we do the same thing. So I'm going to let this converge to 1. And I'm going to also here let this converge to 1 and this converge to 1 at the same time. And then I get this formula. And in fact, I have an inequality here. But again, in the project, you will prove that this is in fact an equality. Yeah, there's nothing lost here. Only problem is here. Is there any questions? Yes. No, t here, here T of C goes to 1, and this also goes to 1. That is the large bit. It's because this is smaller than this, always. You can prove that quite easily, yeah. Maybe it's not so immediate, but it's, the same. it's exactly the same what we did with Eric. Yeah, yeah. So th I agree. It's not so obvious to uh, see that. Uh, but this, this, is, this is the way that you achieve the maximum. Yeah, so because this always has to let... So if, let, if I let this go to 0, this also has to go to 0. Yeah, there's a constraint um, that these must sum to T of C. So this must always be less than that. That's why, yeah? So you, you can prove it very easily that this is where the maximum is achieved, yeah? Okay, it's a good question. It's a good question, yeah? I know it's not entirely trivial uh, that it works that way, but it does, yeah? Okay, any other questions? No, all right. So, um, so what we're going to do then? Remember the formula for interval dominance. We compare the upper bounds with the gamma maximin value, so the maximum of the lower bound. So this is the lower bound. We calculate the maximum, and we choose all classes for which the upper bound is larger than that. Okay. So you can see to implement this computationally, this is uh, well trivial. Yeah, and you you have the code actually in one of the notebooks. It's just it's just a few lines. It's it's really. Uh, not not that difficult. So the main thing is that this classifier can mul return multiple classes if it's unsure about the probability. So if it's very if these bounds are very narrow, it will give a single class. If they become wider, it will start to output multiple classes. And again, that's something that you will see uh, happening in the classification. So this is called creedal classification because it really returns multiple classes. Of course, there are other ways that you might do this, a bit precise probability, but this is the way you would do it in a robust uh, base uh, setting. Okay, so um, there are a few things I need to talk about. Uh, so now I would say let's dive into the code, but there are a few small things with classification I need to explain. Um, so first of all, uh, how do we, so what matters here is the performance of the classifier. And I want you to kind of get a feeling of how these creedal classifiers perform. And uh, typically what you do, you have some data set where you already know the class. And what we're going to do is we're going to train or model we're going to estimate the probabilities from that data set and then apply that to do some tests. 
And the way we do that is actually we only look at a subset of the data to train our model, and then we test it on the rest. Yeah? That's how you do things. So that's what we're going to do. So we have some training data and test data. We're going to use the training data to create a model, so to, to estimate these n values and to estimate these lower and upper probabilities. They're going to be based on part of the data, and the rest of the data we're going to classify and then calculate some diagnostic. And typically, what the diagnostic you calculate is how often was this classifier correct? How often did it predict the correct class? Yeah? Uh, but for credit classifiers, there's other metrics that are also sensible, and I'll explain them in a little bit. And then we could just average these uh, diagnostics over everything. So, of course, uh, you might think there's, um, we use only part of the data for training and part for testing. So typically what is done is something called k-fold cross-validation. And that's what you, what you do is you have your data set, uh, say you divide it into two parts. So what you're going to do is you're going to train it on this part, test it on this part, and then uh, you swap it around and you train on the part for, on, on that part, and then you test on the other part, and then you have tested on everything, and have you also you've also trained on everything. So that's twofold cross validation. But you can also what we typically do is take because then we're only training on half of the data each time. Uh, what people typically do they do tenfold cross validation is kind of a standard. Uh, you can play around with this tenfold. So you can increase it uh, if you like or decrease it. Uh, there's a yeah. Uh, I think 10 is kind of the standard to do. You can investigate it. The code will always use 10 if you want. You can investigate the impact of that as well. So we're going to do this 10 times. So we're going to divide our data in 10 parts. And then the first time we train on nine parts of the data and test on uh, um, uh, the last tenth. And then we move on and we just change the test part every time and then we train on the rest. Yeah, and again, the code will take care of that. And you don't need to worry too much about this. But uh, I just want to explain that what is happens. And then we just average all these diagnostics over all the runs. Uh, so that's what's happening. Again, the code will, uh, will, will contain all these details. Uh, it's not difficult, but um, uh, it is standard uh, for testing. So what accuracy measures do we do? So um, if you just test a single thing, <laughs> just think of focus on a single test you do. So we have the actual class, which is C, and then we have the set of predicted classes, which are denoted by C hat. So it's correct if the actual class is inside the set of predicted classes. It's incorrect if it's not. So that's just a one or a zero. Yeah? So that's for a single row that I test in my data. If I test on multiple things, of course, I will average this out. And what do I get if I average out the ones and zeros? I get a percentage of cases where it was correct. Yeah? So I get accuracy out. Um, for There's also something called single accuracy. And you do the same thing, except you throw away all the cases where you had multiple classes. So this tells you um, the accuracy uh, for the cases where it managed to predict a single class. Yeah? So you, you don't average out over anything else, you just throw that away. Uh, that's what this NA means, just throw it away. Yeah? Uh, you have set accuracy, and that is the same thing, but you can train yourself to the cases where there are multiple classes. Yeah? This is called a set accuracy. Yeah? So these are standard measures used in the literature. I'm introducing this because these are commonly used. Um, there's also another measure you might be interested in is the indeterminate output size. This is just looking at the average, average size that it outputs in those cases where it outputs two or more classes. So this is going to be at least two. Yeah, it's going to be always two or more. And you throw away everything else. And then there's also the determinacy, which is saying how often did it give you a single class. Yeah? And this is interesting because um, if your classifier is highly indeterminate, it's maybe not so useful, right? The most useful classifier is one that, uh, or, yeah, a, a classifier that always opens multiple classes uh, is not as good as one that uh, gives you necessarily, it gives you um, uh, always a determinate answer. Of course, these things, I think, to evaluate a classifier, you need to look at all these measures at the same time uh, to compare them and weigh them according to your priorities. And you will see in the code uh, how that works in practice. So um, I'm going to uh, just explain a little bit about the data set. So I've taken this data set from here. You don't need to click this link or for download this. It's part of the uh, sheet. So just uh, 
a very long <laughs> uh, part of the sheet that you can hide, uh, but it's just imported directly. Um, and the issue, it's a, a breast cancer data set. Uh, and what happens in breast cancer, there is an expert that looks at a mammogram and makes a, a decision based on, well, whatever they know about the history, the age of the patient and other things, together with this image, uh, they make a risk assessment uh, for cancer. And, of course, based on that risk assessment, you want to know does the patient have cancer or not. And uh, what they have noticed is that this um, expert assessment called BIRADS has low predictive power. Yeah, it's not so good. So what people have thought about doing, well, let's actually use some machine learning to improve this. And what they've done is they've calculated, they've done some computer image analysis, which you're not going to do as part of the project, but the outputs of there are in the data set. So they're looking at three features of those images, which are called shape, margin, and density. Yeah, and they're just computed automatically from these images. Uh, and um, so you're given these features, you're given the age. Um, can we try use this in a classifier together with the BIRAD assessment to improve the prediction of whether there's cancer or not? So this is called severity in the data set, zero or one. Um, so that's what you're going to try to do is look at what happens, for example, if you try to predict severity just from the BIRADs, what happens if you include these features? What happens if you exclude these BIRADs and just use these? Or what happens if you try to predict the BIRADs from these features? That you could also do that. Yeah. So there's a lot, lots of questions you can investigate. Uh, the data set has 830 uh, patients. Uh, so you can also investigate what's the impact of the sample size. Yes, yeah? so you can reduce the data set. They're randomized, so you can just re re reduce the size of the data set and also uh, what happens if I add more data. Yeah, and you see for 830, uh, the case for uh, a creative classifier is not, maybe not that strong. Uh, but if you have a low, smaller data set or if you're trying to achieve certain specific things with uh, accuracy, uh, maybe a creedal classifier starts to make sense, yeah. And uh, we're, we're going to do that in the uh, in the project, so as well. So um, I got this here. Uh, so I'm just going to go through that very briefly, and then in the last half hour, uh, you can work through that. Um, so let me maybe um, where is it? Uh, it's here. This one. So there's this data set, it's very long, so I suggest you click this to hide it. Yeah, because it's a really, 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 really long string that contains the data. Um, you got this tolerance as usual. Um, does everybody have it in front of them? Can you nod if you have? Yeah, okay. So uh, here there's loads of data set, you don't need to look at this. There's some pre-processing, so I've here named some constants and they correspond to the columns of the different attributes. So BIRADS is the first column, which is Python counts from zero, so I call that zero. Age is the first one, shape is the second, and margin the third, density fourth, and severity uh, is five. So here we load the data. There's some discretization happening with the age. So the age attribute will take values 75 for 75 and up, 55 for 55 and up, 45 for 45 and up, and zero for everything else. Um, there are some typos in the data, <laughs> so I fixed that here. Um, and then we just uh, return uh, this as a, as a row. So this is what it does. So it, this, this cancer data is just a very large sequence of, sequ of rows of sequences. Yeah. Uh, and you can run this. So there's 830 that have been loaded here. Maybe I should run this entire code. Um, so let's just do that. Um, so, yeah. So as I said, we're going to train a model. And the model, really, what we're interested in is the counts. Yeah. So I have the important things are, well, I need to keep track of which columns, what is the class, class column, what are the attribute columns that I take from this data. I need to know that uh, to do my calculations. Uh, but I'm also going to calculate uh, the number of observations. The N, N of C is going to be named NC, and then uh, it's going to be the seeth element of that. So it's going to be a map. 
or, or dictionary. Someone was asking about data uh, <laughs> data structures. So we're going to use a dictionary for this in Python. Uh, and I'm just explaining here what this all means. And then you have this S constant that is used by the Creedle classifier. That's just going to be part of this model as well that you specify. Uh, so here is a the, the model training. Training model is very simple. We just calculate these counts from the data. So we're just giving the data sets. So we're giving the C column, the A column, so the S value. And what it does, it just does counts. It just counts from the data. How often do you see a certain class? How often do you see a certain row and class combination? That's all it does. So this code is very simple. Uh, but uh, these counter uh, objects are actually dicts, and they do. It's the perfect data structure that fits this. If you don't understand this, it's fine. Uh, and here I've just trained this model. So you can calculate uh, the number of patients without cancer. So that would be NC0, severe, so the outcome zero is no cancer. So you see there's 427, and there is 403 that have cancer equal to one. And then, for example, number of cancer patients with bioresistance five. So what you do is do NAC. This is the combination of attribute and class, so I call it NAC. And then I look at BIRAD, so I need to specify this column. I say call BIRAD. This is just a number. This is zero with columns, so it's just zero, but I don't like writing zero because it's just not clear. It's clearer to write call BIRADs. And then um, the five is just the first element. This is a pair. The first element is going to be AI. Yeah, that's five here. And C is one. Yeah. Uh, here, find the number of patients in the data set age over 75 that have no cancer. I'm going to do that together with you so you can get used to uh, doing this. Uh, so I need age, yeah? So I need to write call age, yeah? I for It's the first column, actually. I can tell it's one. And then the attribute value, what is this going to be? I need to change this five to... 75 and above, I represented this with, well, maybe I can look back at my code, with the number 75, yeah? So that's going to be, where is it? 75, and then no cancer is C equal to zero. Yeah, you can do that. And I see it's 10, yeah? So that's the number here. Um, so, yeah, your naive base class, so this is the code. So you can implement a naive base classifier by just calculating the probability of C, the probability of A and C together for all possible attributes. So that's what happens here. So remember this model NAC that's uh, like this here. Yeah, we're doing this thing here to find NAC. NAC. Uh, and then this code does that, and then just multiply everything together. And then you do this, calculate it for every class, this is the actual class. You find the maximum probability values. And then, so this is the maximum probability value. And then you return a one, which means it's correct. If it was the maximum probability, so if probability of, of the test case is uh, larger than the, uh, uh, or equal to the maximum probability with some tolerance, and otherwise it was not accurate, okay? So that's your accuracy measure. So this is a naive base classifier. There's only one class that's ever output. So, um, so um, it's, it's just accuracy is, is all we're interested in. Uh, and then you can uh, combine all of these outcomes together. So this will just, uh, yeah, output a zero or one effectively. I put it in a sequence because I may need multiple accuracy measures later. I do have here some function that averages everything out. Again, I'm not going to talk much about that. You can go through the code to try to understand it. But what you see, if I just do this, if I use the cancer model, so I, I trained it on the data, and then I test every element in the data on that trained model, then I get a mean accuracy of 83.8%. Yeah, that's what you see. And as long as you understand that you need to do this, I'm happy. Yeah, you can try to understand the rest of the code. It's all there. It's not very long. You can try to make sense of it. Uh, I do encourage you to do that. Uh, but uh, if, if, that's, uh, if you don't want to, you don't have to. Okay, so, but the problem here is that I have trained the model. I'm testing on the same data that I've used to train. And that's kind of considered cheating. Yeah, 
so you shouldn't do that. So instead we do k-fold cross-validation, and this is this here. So what we do here, we do a number of um, uh, yeah, uh, repeats of this training and testing, and it's the number of folds here, I think this is usually taken to be 10, but you can play around with this value. Um, uh, and uh, so I have the test data that I select here, and that's this. Uh, I have the training data, which is this. So don't, don't worry if you don't understand the syntax. You just need to know it does the right thing. And then we train this model on the training data. And then I add to my outcomes uh, the tests from the test data, we return all the outcomes, and then we can take the average. So if I do this, um, I get 83.37%, so 83.4% accuracy. So this is a little bit lower than what I had before, 83.8. Um, I had here 83.3. Um, why is it a little bit lower? Yeah. That's right. So we've, 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 we've trained on a smaller size of data set. Yeah, we only use 90% of the data each time to train and then 10% of the data to test. So that, of course, will reduce. You expect a reduction in accuracy. So if you take more folds, if you increase the fold from 10 to 20, you'll see a slight increase again. You should see or expect more or less, normally, a slight increase in accuracy. But it will not be much. I think 10 is deemed considered like reason, a reasonable value. You don't want to take it too low. Like for two, uh, it goes down quite a bit. But uh, if 10 is like deemed a good compromise, uh, between that. So for the naive creel classifier, it's the same thing. We have these formulas that I gave you earlier. Uh, we do the same thing. So here I'm calculating the intervals for PC, PCA, PACS. Again, you don't need to understand this full code. Just know that it does the right thing. And then we just do the same thing. It's almost identical, except that we have lower and upper bounds. Then I find a maximum lower probability. And then... Uh, the set size is just uh, uh, the uh, I'm, I'm doing something here to calculate the uh, uh, size of the creedal set, and here I'm also calculating whether or not it's correct uh, as per the formulas that we have introduced. So you can analyze this and convince yourself this is correct. But here we have again instead of just the accuracy, if it's correct, otherwise near zero. We also have the single accuracy. And none here is used as a placeholder for saying, throw it away. Yeah, that's what it does. That's what this function mean outcome will do. If it sees a none, it will throw it away and not include it in the calculation. Um, so we have a single accuracy, set accuracy, indeterminate set size, and determinacy. And what you see if we do this now, we have 84%. So our accuracy has gone up a little bit, but this is for you know the very large data set, just a little bit. The single accuracy is 83.8 .8 as before. And now you see something interesting. The set accuracy is 100%. It's the third value. So you can see here, it's always accuracy, single accuracy, set accuracy is one. Indeterminate set size is always two. Why is that? Um, and then... Determinacy is 98%. So in 90% of cases, they gave a single class. Yeah, so it's highly accurate. And the reason for that is, of course, we have a large data set. So I'm going to let you think about why that is. I'm not going to tell you. So you can think about that. Uh, is this useful for this data? M maybe not. Well, maybe it is. Um, and then the, here's a real fun. So here's some code. And I, I'm sure you can understand this or play around with this if you want, where I vary the sample size, yeah, and you see the impacts of these outcomes. So this is for the base, naive base classifier with just no sets, and this is the imprecise classifier. You got all these values here that you can try to interpret and um, and discuss a bit. Why are they going up? Are they going down? Are they changing? Why are they changing? What does this mean? Um, and then similarly. I've varied S from 0 0.01. It has to be strictly positive, theoretically, so that's why I didn't take it to be 0. 1 and 2 are standard values. I've also taken 10, 100, and 1,000, uh, which is uh, you should not do, but I want to show you what happens if you do. Yeah, it's, it's, still, it's still kind of theoretically interesting uh, to look at what happens if you do that. So... Um, yeah, so you can again discuss this, and then there are some extra exercises here uh, about this S value, uh, and I hope you get there. So, um, 
I'm going to let you say, so yeah, we will only have 20 minutes, it looks like. But I also want to point out the project description here at the end. So um, basically, it's further exploring the data set. It's deriving some theoretical results. Um, let me maybe increase this a bit. Uh, wait, can this work? Yeah. Um, to improve these bounds. So we use these interval bounds and I said we're making some approximation there, you can fix this. And this was actually done by a master student of mine. I don't think this is in the literature anywhere because people typically don't use interval dominance for the creative classifier. Uh, but you, you can actually find the exact results and it takes a bit of work. So this is pen and paper. You can't do this in code. You have to do this on pen and paper. Uh, but if you manage to do this, you can just see, can you improve the creative classifier? So it's going to be part of the project. Uh, you can also look at robust based maximality. So this was typically done. Uh, and uh, robust base admissibility for this creative classifier, and you can uh, again improve the code uh, and test what happens. How does it improve? And you can see indeed if you compare with the creedal uh, interval with the interval dominance classifier, this is really better. You can show it uh, generally is better. So that is quite interesting. Uh, so for all of these tasks, just to for the project to to uh, mention that. Um, the most of them require some coding, so if you're not comfortable with that, maybe don't pick it. Uh, but that said, uh, there are some purely theoretical questions as well, and it, I think it's perfectly possible for a subgroup to work on this without doing any Python. Uh, just looking at the theory, uh, I think that is possible. Uh, and you can, of course, do anything you like. Uh, and I'm making some suggestions for S and the sample size, uh, but obviously, uh, I'm also happy if people do things with this that I do not ask. Yeah, that's totally fine. Uh, if you want to do something else with this data set that you think, oh, this is a question I have, I want to try to answer that, that's fine. But you have a lot of questions here. I don't think you can do everything in the project on Friday, but uh, uh, maybe one or two of these things should be, should be quite feasible. Okay, and you can find a full description of all these questions here. And for the last question, I have given code that will help you uh, because it's a bit a lot. Otherwise, it's, I think it's too much and too hard. All right, okay, so I'll stop here. Uh, and I think we have uh, 20 minutes again to work on some exercises. So either you do the, if you want to work, don't want to work on this machine learning stuff, go back to the previous sheet and work on that. If you want to do more with this machine learning stuff, you can work on this sheet. It's just however you wish. All right, good. Okay, let's, uh, let's go. Okay, everybody, I'm afraid we're already at the end. Uh, it's been very, very uh, exciting for me to see you all working and, and, and working with the code and trying to ask questions and making sense of things. So if you have any questions about anything, I'm here for the entire uh, rest of the school. I'm just walking around here. So please do ask. Uh, if you have any questions about the project as well, please do ask. Uh, and I think it's time for a well-deserved lunch now. <laughs> okay, all right. Thank you. Thank you.